It's my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Mark Wesney, Professor of Organismal Biology and Anatomy at the University of Chicago. Uh, Mark is a uh, ichthyologist and biomechanist and phylogeneticist uh, who runs an extremely integrative uh, research program at Chicago that incorporates biomechanics, morphology, and phylogenetics uh, into understanding the evolution and maintenance of biodiversity in reef fishes, uh, especially in wrasses. I first encountered Mark as an undergraduate in his excellent comparative anatomy course, uh, which he's teaching again right now. Uh, and that course uh, gradually eroded my anti-fish bias uh, to the point where uh, when I graduated, I asked him for a job in his lab. Um, and as he so often does for undergraduates, Mark uh, graciously offered one. And I had the absolute privilege of being a part of uh, that lab and doing all sorts of fantastic uh, biomechanical and morphological research uh, with him. And uh, that played a, a huge role in uh, shaping my uh, research interests today. And so uh, I hope that uh, you will all enjoy hearing about what he does as much as uh, I enjoyed uh, playing a part in it. So take it away, Mark. Thank you, Isaac. Thanks everybody for coming. It's a real pleasure to be here. I, I wish I was there instead of here, here. But um, uh, yeah, I appreciate that introduction. I'm going to share my screen and jump into some of our work on phylogenetics and evolutionary biomechanics. Let me go ahead and do the full screen there. Um, I think somebody was going to video record this. I don't know if uh, I should do that. Maybe. Oh, it's I see being it. recorded. It's being recorded. Thanks. Great, so, so I am interested in talking today about this kind of two sides of my laboratory, phylogenetics and evolutionary biomechanics. And as Isaac mentioned, we tend to focus on labyrinth fishes. We've been working on butterfly fishes and angel fishes and damsel fishes and things like that as well. But, but here, here on my cover slide are two of my favorite big bruiser characters from the wrasses. This is the, the humphead parrotfish on the left, Bulba metapon, and the humphead mary wrasse, Chelinus undulatus, on the right, who it turns out are quite closely related in the phylogeny of, of labyrinth fishes. They have been and, and in some places continue to be classified as in separate families, but actually they're they are mere tribes away from one another within the grand scheme of the labyrinth tree. So coral reef fishes has been my passion. I grew up in the Midwest, so why the heck did that happen? Um, I ended up in high school going to the Bahamas for a while and, and, and just ended up with a, with a, I grew up fishing for like centrarchids and things like that. But I, I ended up with a passion for marine fishes and, and my students and I typically choose these large, colorful, fun to look at, often found in, in aquarium um, uh, settings and things like that, but also uh, shallow water, uh, relatively easy to access groups of fishes. And our aim has been to build large phylogeny, species rich phylogenies, to get as many tissue samples, as many museum specimens as, as possible. And so during a, a period of about 25 years at the Field Museum, I've been cruising around trying to get as many of these guys as I can into our collections and into our tissue samples. And I take two approaches, phylogenetics. Um, I have this phylogenetics is slide to remind me to explain what phylogenetics is if I'm giving a talk to a more general audience. Obviously, it's the, uh, you all know what it is. It's the quest for the tree of life with this example from the parrot fishes that I chose today because Lydia Smith was the first author on this paper. She was my lab tech and, and uh, worked in the molecular labs at the at the Field Museum for, for many years, and she led this effort. Um, and so we're looking for branching patterns of relationship here among the parrot fishes, which is this, this sort of crown reef clade and this um, slightly lower in the tree seagrass clade relative to some of these key line wrasses. So that's an example of what phylogenetics is. The other thing I'll be talking about is what biomechanics is. Here's some biomechanics for you. This is a high-speed video 
of Taroas volatans, the, the lionfish that's invasive in the Caribbean. Watch this suction. He sucks that fit big goldfish right off the forceps. We have a developing kinematic data set on this, um, measuring the speed with which the prey item goes into the mouth by which you can calculate suction force. We think one of the secrets to the deadliness of the, of the invasive lionfish in the Caribbean is that they have a big mouth, but their suction force is still high, which is sort of unusual because suction forces are typically high in fishes with small mouths, tube-shaped mouths to get a real pipe going. These guys have a high suction force with a quite a large pipe. So we're trying to work out the, the numbers on that. So phylogenetics and biomechanics with an emphasis on reef biodiversity. So here's a little map of coral reefs across you know, the equatorial and, and north and south from there are regions across the globe. These are where most of my fishes live. And the red dots are places I've been to go and get them from the Caribbean to the coasts of Africa to the Red Sea to Indonesia and Philippines and throughout the Pacific, Hawaiian Islands, places like that down to New Zealand. And, and so this is uh, just a little detail on some of the expeditionary work uh, for, for you museum people. Um, the reason, one of the reasons why we're doing this is ultimately we're interested in biodiversity gradients, how these phylogenetic trees are distributed amongst biogeographic provinces. So here, for example, is the Western Pacific biodiversity gradient with which many of you are familiar with the Philippines and, and Indonesia and, and Papua New Guinea forming this kind of coral triangle, the, the peak of marine biodiversity on earth. And then it kind of, it fades out in terms of species richness, the little plot on the bottom, as you go um, to the east from the, from the Solomons to Vanuatu, Fiji, Tonga, and, and on out the biodiversity of reef fishes drops. We're also interested in curious um, biogeographic provinces. And, and this one will be just a little bit of a thread through this talk, and that is the Red Sea. There's a lot of endemics and unusual kind of assemblages of species in the Red Sea. And we're interested in, I've just become recently interested in, in taking a look at that with these species rich trees to see where do the endemics in the Red Sea come from? Um, are there clades that have uh, originated in the Red Sea or is it just an aggregator of biodiversity? Um, I had a chance to go to um, Egypt and to Saudi uh, about uh, eight and, and nine years ago. Um, so still have a bunch of collections from there. And we do this in a number of ways. Here's one of my favorite expeditions ever. This was the Palau Helen Reef Expedition of 2008, where we had this giant expedition fleet boat. We put together four different academic institutions, with 16 scientists, and 12 ship's mates, and three weeks, three weeks at sea. And it, you know, it costs like $200,000. Um, trying to do it big sometimes works to get to a place like Helen Reef, which is quite isolated. And it was spectacular. We also do it small. Here we are in Papua New Guinea in 2011. My postdoc, Josh Drew, um, two of my graduate students, Charlie McCord and, and uh, Joanna Mandecki. And we had three undergraduates from Papua New Guinea join us and, and did some training in, in fish biodiversity work with them. And here we are much more recently in Morea. Um, we were there um, in 2018 as well, and now we're trying to get back, <laughs> trying to get permits and, and all that sort of thing to get back to Morea. So fish collecting and, and doing observations and things like that. And we see, we see amazing things. So here's uh, my former postdoc, Justin Grubich, on a reef uh, in, in Palau, and, and just huge schools of very valuable like commercial fishes, these carangids and things. Um, uh, the Palauans do a really good job of protecting their reefs. We see really big humphead parrot fishes. This is Bulbo Matapon miracatum. This guy is bigger than me, probably about 200 pounds, big male, um, one of the larger of, of the wrasses. We see great tetradoniforms. Here's a Here's a large puffer. 
we collect a lot of specimens and, and lay them out, pin them out for body shape morphometrics and photo records. This is Ketodon on Ader gastos. Um, and we find these bizarre fishes of shallow water often. We're doing road node stations if we can get permits to do it. So we collect the tiny fishes that live into the rocks like, like Calionemids and, and Alticus blennies. Um, Love this Alticus. He looks like a little orc from Lord of the Rings or something. <laughs> Just fantastic animals. And we take um, the full slate of, of metadata with these guys, uh, locality records, habitat notes, tissue samples, uh, fresh photos like this. And, and these are all in either the Field Museum or the Smithsonian or Royal Ontario Museum primarily now. And, you know, we have encounters with sharks. I'm always swimming around with a bag of dead fish tied to my weight belt. And these, these reef sharks come in, take a close look at me. Um, never had too much trouble. Never give up my bag of fish. <laughs> See lots of other cool things like this hawksbill turtle who can, these turtles can be kind of judgmental. And he's saying, you know, get to the point, Wesney. So what is the point? Um, I was in a tree of life meeting one time with a bunch of phylogeneticists, including Karen Cranston. And she said, if we had the entire tree of life, what would we do with it? So it's one of these things that kind of drives how I think, what would we do with it? <laughs> well, we need to get the tree of life first. So I want to talk about phylogenetics, building some of these new, new trees. We still use a lot of kind of Sanger level 12, 14 gene data sets, but we're moving on to exon capture genomics now. I want to hit um, some biomechanics um, in the second half of the talk and talk about how we're looking at engineering designs of fishes and mapping those onto these trees. And then tree data integration, a little bit of biogeography bio geography thread through here with that red C point and, and patterns and functional character evolution later in the talk. So we do a lot of molecular phylogenetics now um, on some of these groups and others, trigger fishes, file fishes, butterfly fishes, angel fishes, damsel fishes, wrasses and parrot fishes. We have been doing a lot of Sanger sequencing. Um, a lot of our tissues and data sets um, have been building since back the time when, when Lydia Smith was, was in our museum and, and cranking out a lot of this stuff. We mine a lot of stuff from GenBank, of course, and we're moving on uh, to these exon capture and targeted gene capture uh, probes using fish life probes and you know, throwing the whole kitchen sink of phylogenetic analysis techniques at these data sets. Um, the, a lot of the stuff um, of recent work and future work is, is sort of these large exon capture data sets building from the Fish Life Project, which has been a five-year grant with uh, the RT lab, the Betancourt lab, um, our CELA lab now at, at, at Oklahoma, um, Carol Baldwin and, and uh, Lily Hughes, who's my, my postdoc now. So shout out to them. So some examples, trigger fishes and file fishes have been uh, a recurring source of interest in my lab. They're, they're amazing animals, very charismatic. And Charlie McCord did a large Sanger sequencing data set on these guys and figured out how the trigger fishes up here on top are related to the file fishes down here below. And we're still working on some of this stuff. We got the tree out and Charlie's now a, an assistant professor at, at Cal State um, Dominguez Hills out there in California. So she did this tree, we got a nice time tree out of it. You can date the split between the file fishes and the trigger fishes at right at about 50 million years. We think with some of the new fossil calibration dates that this is actually a, a bit older, maybe even quite a bit older than that, maybe back to, to 70 million years old. Um, so we're doing some new analyses of these things. Um, the butterfly fishes is, a, is a, just an amazingly, beautiful group of animals um, with a lot of species pairs like Ketodon fasciatus and Ketodon lunula, the raccoon butterfly fish. You can see the family resemblance between these two taxa on the top. And Jen Fessler um, in my lab started out uh, really with this phylogenetics and biogeography of butterfly fishes. She was the first to kind of map out the 
biogeographic provinces out here in the colors of some of these groups of animals showing the introgression of Eastern Pacific from Indo-West Pacific and, and where the Atlantic and Caribbean bursts of diversification had happened in the butterfly fishes. We're continuing that work, and this is the first example where we can kind of address this Red Sea question that I had. So this is a new tree um, built on Jen's work, also Sanger data. We have 115 out of the 129 butterfly fishes. And the red arrows and red colored branches are taxa that are endemic to the Red Sea. The green branches are taxa that live in the Red Sea, but, but may live elsewhere as well. And then the Indian Ocean and Pacific things are in blue and black. And so the, first, the, the answer that the butterfly fishes gives us to this endemic question is no, it's not a single group. It's the Red Sea has sampled and, 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 and isolated taxa throughout the tree. So there are Red Sea endemics and Red Sea residents sprinkled throughout the tree. Um, which is kind of an interesting um, finding. There is no like particular clay that's radiated there. Um, the Red Sea appears to be an aggregator um, that's done this for 40 million years with the butterfly fishes. We're also interested in, and, and so one, another way to look at this is with one of these um, ancestral area reconstructions using the distinction uh, dispersal extinction cladogenesis model. This is a model proposed by Rick Ree, and this here it's implemented in BioGeo Bears on our package. And you see here, um, green is Pacific origin ancestry, um, blue is Indo-Pacific origins, the pink is Atlantic origins. You see all of these pretty deep in the tree, but you don't see any red. Red would signify Red Sea ancestry. And you know, that's where we would expect to see if there was a clay that was Red Sea origin, we would expect to see some red in these pies, but we don't. There's a little bit of teeny bit of red up in here because there's a couple Red Sea taxa in that clay. Um, and we're interested in the broader patterns of butterflies and angels. So butterflies and angel fishes have been proposed to be each other's sister groups. And then recent uh, larger data sets have pulled them apart but we wanted to ask about that with our sort of 14 gene um, set of, of data from Sanger sequencing. And so this gets, uh, it's as complicated as butterflies and angels, rabbits and ponies, surgeons and chubs, bats, dats, and scats. Um, because this group, Squamopinies, the sort of spiny finned um, percoids, was proposed by Cuvier. And the core groups were thought to be these on these here on the left, the butterfly fishes, angel fishes, zanclus, and 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 bat fishes and 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 scats and and acantheroids and things like that. But he also and other people have suggested that gyraids and lignathids and gerelids and kyphosids and things that are kind of spread out all over the, the Euprecarian, the larger crowned fish tree, might be. Um, involved. And so we have this data set for um, um, about 450 now tax. I'm going to show you a 408 tax on tree. So here's the answer. We have almost all the butterfly fishes and almost all the angel fishes up here at top. And they are each other's sister groups in our data sets. And we're really interested to know whether this will be, this will also be recovered with genomic level data sets where we have much more data because these branch internodes are short and the lignathids over here these these crazy lignathids um, pop in between the pomacanthids and ketodontids if you just look at them crosswise um, and that's because they have a very short inner node with platax and these these um, acantheroid tax over here and so sometimes the keats and angels get broken up Right now they're together in our data set and they have a decent branch length. But then these other things, sparids and rabbit fishes and kyphosids and gyraids are, are thought to be you know, uh, much more spread throughout the tree and, and are not probably squamapines. If we had to um, end up with a squamapine group, it might be the Keats spomacanthids plus the um, acantheroid taxa here would probably be a, a reasonable grouping. On to damselfishes. 
Finding Nemo, right? So these are two American Caribbean damselfishes, the Beau Gregory and the Sergeant Major. Um, and Jim Cooper in my lab started this. Uh, here's a base of a tree of damselfishes. Um, this is all a big Sanger data set as well. And Jim got us going on it. And we've recently um, developed a much larger data set with 330 of the 420 taxa. And we've just submitted it to PLOS One. It's, it's up on BioArchive if anybody's interested in it. It's in review now. And so where's Nemo? There he is. Um, these are the Amphiprion uh, tax up here, which are really interesting within the pomocentrids because they have all evolved in like the last 10 million years. And in fact, this big radiation of Amphiprion up in here is within the last 5 million years. So we do have a little bit of burst and slow kind of evolution in the damselfishes um, on this time calibrated phylogeny. And the point of this paper, though, was to develop this new tree. It increases the number of tacks in the tree by, by 100 or so. And um, to look at the Red Sea question with a big tree. And so here in red again are the Red Sea endemics. There's a little bit of an absence of them along here, although we have Red Sea residents over here. But the Red Sea endemics and residents are, again, spread throughout the tree. Um, so the Red Sea has just seemingly randomly uh, sampled um, from the phylogeny um, of, of damselfishes as well as butterfly fishes. And here's that ancestral area reconstruction. And we can see a little bit of red here. Um, this pie chart has a little <laughs> corner of red. And that's because there's a, a, a little group of Red Sea endemics up in here. But the rest of the tree looks exactly like the key tree. You know, the Red Sea has not been the generator, it's not been the, the large clade origin spot um, due to its, you know, frequent um, isolation and, and refilling and things like that over the last million years or 10 million years. So, um, the other thing we did with damselfishes in this new paper, which turned out to be fairly interesting, I think, is we, the damselfishes are either benthic they graze on algae or, or, or detritus and stuff on the bottom. Or they're pelagic here in yellow, the benthics are in purplish and the pelagics are in yellow. Or they're, in, they're intermediate, the, the pelagics, these are all the chromas, they're primarily um, planktivores, so planktivores. Um, and, or, or it's intermediate where you play both games. You can do the benthic carnivory or you can swim up and eat uh, plankton when it's, when it's dense. And we found that the diversification rates of pomocentroids were relatively steady with the exception of this amphiprion burst and one other burst over, over here in Chroma somewhere. And that they always go through the intermediate state. They never transition straight from benthic to pelagic or, or, or the other way. They always transition through the intermediate state. And that transition rate is asymmetrical. So it favors one direction over another. So some groups, like down here at the base of the tree, some groups get stuck. These guys are stuck basically in the benthic and they, they occasionally transition back to the intermediate. These guys are pretty much stuck in the pelagic and they transition a little bit back to the intermediate. But this crown of the tree has a lot of cycling back and forth which we think drives the diversification. In fact, we tested this with a hidden states model, a multiple hidden states model to look for the effect of ecotype on diversification. And it is significant, particularly for the crown of the tree. And this is some of Chloe Nash's work in, in my lab. She, she ran these mu hissy models for us. So asymmetry in some of these traits, we also find it in body size, asymmetry in the diversification rates of body size appears to be a driver of species diversification patterns in this family. We'd like to apply this to some of these other families as well. On to the wrasses, Isaac's favorite. Um, here's the Caribbean hogfish, Lachnolamus maximus. So Mike Alfaro uh, got us started on this um, quite, a, quite a ways in the, in the past now. Um, here's our 104 taxon tree. Um, for that had cichlids, zembiotosids, and pomocentrages outgroups. Um, and 
this, you know, this was a Bayesian analysis of a reasonable size Sanger data set for the time for 104 species. And basically this topology still stands today. Um, so Mike, Mike really got it right. We have built it a lot. Um, we've built it by group. So here's the phylogeny of the parrot fishes that um, Lydia Smith uh, helped us develop. And there's Lydia. Oh, wait, that's not Lydia. There's Lydia. <laughs> Parrotfish to Lydia. I don't know if she's here today. Hi, Lydia, if you're here. <laughs> um, so, so this was uh, a, a step on our way to getting the tree of all parrotfishes. And uh, we're really interested in this because um, of their jaw mechanics and because of their color patterns. And, and, and there's a lot of people interested in this. We have CT scans of of a bunch of these fishes. So, so uh, yeah, neat group and filling out these subclades is part of getting the tree, the story for the whole tree. One of the neat things we did with this parrotfish paper is we started targeting um, genes with known functions. So regulatory genes, um, uh, BMP4 and uh, OTX1 and DLX2 are all genes that are shown through the Evo Devo community to build the jaw, have an impact on brain structure or anterior craniofacial structure, or the DLX um, is known to play a role in pharyngeal, the early pharyngeal development. And we found that the regulatory genes and the non regulatory genes agreed. So we split them apart and we ran only the regulatory. And we found that the regula these regulatory genes, which you might expect to be fairly conserved, um, and they are, but they do have phylogenetic information. And um, there were very few disagreements between the non-regulatory and the regulatory loci. And we also found bursts of positive selection in BMP4, at least, um, up here in the parrot fishes for the, the, the BMP4 gene. So suggestive, we don't know what the positive selection on BMP4 means in terms of the jaw or whatever, but, but uh, one of those things that makes you go, hmm, wonder what that mechanism is. Here's a slightly bigger tree of wrasses. This is, uh, I think this is our 340 taxon tree um, from a PNAS paper a few years ago on fin um, anatomy. And here's the parrot fishes nested deeply within the wrasses related to the European labyrinths and the Maori wrasses from the Pacific. Oh, this is actually 520 taxa. We're up to 555 or something like that. With just some of the, if you know these fishes at all, the, the crown group up here, the Halicaries group is all over the place. Lots of taxonomic work to do here. The cool razor fishes are down here. The fairy and flame wrasses that, that Kai T has just published a nice paper on are here, the parrot fishes. Uh, the Tuscushion and hog fishes are the area that um, Isaac worked on. I'll show you a quick frame of his data in a few minutes. We have also done the entire tree of all wrasse life. <laughs> so this is a big morphological matrix for the taxa that we don't have um, DNA for integrated with the molecular data. We still have a lot of work to do on this, so it's not quite ready for prime time. But we do have this topology, which is taking form which is a total evidence tree based on Sanger plus morph. Um, and now we're, we're, uh, we're trying to do the, the axon capture um, sequencing on all these guys. Let's take a look at the Red Sea question real quick with this huge like 450 species tree. Once again, the red arrows are all over the place and the green bars are as well. So the Red Sea truly is a sampler of phylogenetic clades um, it, from the Indian Ocean um, across multiple families, um, very consistent patterns we're getting here. And with the except, uh, the wrasses um, show several areas of deep Red Sea ancestry. This deepest one here in the middle is this group of pteragogas that appears to have originated, um, at least the ancestral reconstruction suggests that it originated um, about 20 million years ago in the Red Sea, or they all live there now at least, and, and it's either sampled that whole clade or they originated there. But we're also seeing Red Sea bars of, of red 
in a lot of these ancestral um, pie charts for um, area reconstruction. So the Rasses might be a little bit different where the Red Sea has created some, some um, diversification events uh, within, within the Red Sea or, or in the, in the Aden Socotra region right next to it. Um, we are now um, well on our way to having a large exon capture data set. So um, this is work of Lily Hughes in my lab now as a postdoc. And so this is our big 550 taxon Sanger phylogeny with the red bars out here, just indicating the taxa that we've now done the exon capture sequencing for. So I think we're about 300 or 320 taxa. We have the two to three million bases in from this exon capture set of probes that was developed by the Fish Life Group. And here's the tree, 280 taxa. Two, two to three million bases. This is all Lily's work and uh, we'll have it ready soon. And the take home messages, which I find fascinating, is that we have almost no changes to the tree topology from having exon capture phyl phylogenomic level sampling. It's almost perfectly congruent with the Sanger sequencing data set for 12 or 14 genes. Um, we do occasionally get the pseudo key line group moving around one node, depending upon which set of the exon capture data set we use. And I don't know for, you know, we're just, uh, my lab is just starting to get into the phylogenomics, but I don't, I don't know if this is a common pattern amongst other groups of organisms. If the, if the 15, 10, 15, 20 gene data sets are really doing it for us in other groups or whether the phylogenomics just really opens your eyes about the basic tree. I'd be interested to, to hear how, what others are finding. At least for the RASAs, it reinforces uh, what we already knew and it really does help us with branch support in some areas, so no doubt about it. All right, on to the biomechanics. So I'll probably do about 20 minutes of this. And, and uh, so these RASAs are super diverse in their feeding, um, habits, they eat everything, different groups do, molluscivores, crustaceivores, piscivores, herbivores, planktivores, um, you know, a lot of these parrot fishes that we call herbivores are actually not, they're, they're, they're eating bacterial mat, and some of them specialize on sponges and stuff like that, so just within that parrot fish group, there's a lot of dietary diversity that, that remains to be explored, and so I take a Kind of an engineering approach to these animals and try to figure out how their heads work. And we, uh, the thing about fish heads, for those of you who don't know, is there's a whole lot of motion going on here. Um, the green arrows represent muscle inputs to yank back the head and cause this red motion, cranial elevation. The suspensorium uh, gets abducted by the adductor arcus palatini muscle. The opercle rotates due to the levator operculi muscle. There's um, sternohyoidus contraction and pectoral retraction from body muscles. The lower jaw rotates, the maxilla swings forward, the palatine drops, and the premaxilla shoots forward um, in sort of this RAS head explosion of motion. So we try to capture this on high speed video and, and uh, analyze the engineering design of these things. How are these working as levers and linkages? And uh, how have they evolved? And so we're, we're aggregating this big data layer on structure function in these guys. So here's a parrotfish chomping away at a, at a piece of coral in the lab. They have very forceful jaws, short, stout uh, jaws that are capable of biting chunks of coral off of, off of the substrate or scraping, um, calcareous algae, chewing on sponges, that sort of thing. So they're very force adapted. Um, they don't have a fast bite, but they have a very forceful bite. In contrast, the sling jaw wrasse, pretty close relative to those parrot fishes, does this. So they are suction feeding predators. They eat mostly evasive prey. They will eat some floating you know, crab larvae and stuff like that. Um, but they have this completely modified mechanism of, 
uh, the a movable quadrate and a long pre-maxillary ascending process. And so they've developed a strategy of stop and shoot the suction tube at the prey. Okay, one more time. And you can see the suction, that fish just flies off the forceps. So, so and, and everything in between, right? So the lower jaws of these animals are super diverse. They are some like huge stout, um, uh, jaws like this cordon tusk fish. Here's a paired fish jaw. It actually has an extra jaw joint in it. Um, Semicosophus pulcher has a big, um, heavy biting jaw. But then you have these gracile long jaws for, you know, fast capture. Uh, much more delicate jaws for for capturing fishes. They tend to have, you know, sharp teeth like in Kilio, which is a piscivore. So, what are the mechanics of these things? We go kind of on first engineering principles, looking at levers. Um, all of these jaws and, and, and most levers in vertebrates are third order levers, like your elbow, where your elbow's back here, um, down here at the bottom um, is the fulcrum. Your biceps muscle pulls in on your forearm and you're, you know, when you're lifting a load out at the hand, that's a third order lever. That's the same as a jaw, as a lower jaw. There are second order levers in the pharyngeal jaws, for example, and there are uh, first order levers in, in biomechanical systems as well, but the third order lever is, is quite common. And so we model this, I've developed these computational models. This is the latest version of Amanda Believer. Um, it's free on my GitHub site. And you collect coordinate data, fairly simple set of coordinate data on the lower jaw metrics. And, and these are the muscle insertion points. And then you need the muscle masses and some kind of um, estimate or guess or use published data on what its maximum force per unit area is in, in kilopascals using basic physiology of, of uh, vertebrate striated muscle. It's somewhere around two to 300 kilopascals for, for muscle force. And we can simulate the muscle uh, bite force the, the total bite force of this animal out at the tip of the jaw, somewhere in the middle, back at the rear, and compute maximum muscle force, torque, work, power, and the, ultimately the bite force out. So this little fish, this is RAS1 in my test data set, it is generating a maximum, where's the maximum acting force of the A2, the pars malaris muscle, is about three newtons. Uh, if you don't know exactly what a Newton is, an apple, a small and medium sized apple sitting in your hand is about one Newton. Um, so, so it's not a lot of force and they only put, you know, less than a Newton of bite force out. So this little fish is, uh, you know, it's doing its job. It's got about um, two thirds of a Newton with each of its main jaw muscles. And we apply these across the, the, the metrics for the, uh, for, these taxa as many as we can measure. We also go one level more complex with these linkage models. So here's a diagram of the four bar linkage of the jaws. This is actually a mechanism I um, proposed back when I was a grad student. This anterior jaws one, the apercal one, there's one in the hyoid as well. And these four bar linkages are common in engineering and they're great because they allow you to compute things relatively easily. And, and you can build them too. This is my little video of how this works. So the apercal gets pulled back, transmits force to the lower jaw, that drops the lower jaw, swings the maxilla forward, and you can see the upper jaw protrude. That anterior jaws linkage is sort of the key to upper jaw protrusion, which we think is important. And so we can measure all of these using a morphometric protocol across these. We can calculate the levers and we can calculate the linkages. And the linkages then go into a much more complicated model. So <laughs> this is my JAWS model 2020, the latest, latest edition of these. I write these uh, apps in uh, Xcode for the Mac. It's a sort of heritage of the old Pascal code from Code Warrior, but we've adapt adapted them to Xcode. So this is a bird RAS which, with its four bar linkage and its lower jaw lever sticking out here and the all three main adductor muscles that power it. And we can do all these computations of mechanical advantage and we can put hill muscle models in there and compute bite forces and things like that. And it kind of looks like here, I'll just 
you can you can rotate the jaw more and compute how much the muscles stretch you know just kind of pop it back and forth and and imagine simulating this jaw opening how much uh, maxillary rotation does it take to protrude the jaw x amount and these are quite variable across species so we're doing this modeling and we use it to compare taxa and roughly assess whether they're adapted for force for biting for speed, for capturing prey, or whether they're somewhere in between. And the original answer to this um, was published uh, 15 years ago now in 2005 in this big collaborative paper with the Wainwright Lab and the Bellwood Lab, where we measured this across that 104 taxon tree. We had 15 independent origins with fast jaws. But we've moved on from there. Here's, a, here's an evolutionary plot of this jaw mechanism where the black branches are are low um, kt or 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 high mechanical advantage so they're force adapted the blue are intermediates and the red are, are high speed so like these oxychelinus up here are all piscivores they have a speed specialized jaw hologymnosis is a great piscivore way over here and it's it's fast with its jaws and so we have 20 independent origins of fast jaws but more interesting, the point of this paper is that every clade has every kind of jaw in it. And close relatives often have very different kind of jaws. Not the parrot fishes. These are the parrot fishes. They all have the same force adapted jaw. But most clades have this local divergence. Close relatives are diverging rapidly from one another. Is it competition, some kind of character displacement? Who knows? But what we find is that these local divergences create global convergences. So most of these fast jaws have converged on a similar design across clades for feeding on evasive prey. And so we get, we get divergence causing convergence, which is an interesting kind of iterative pattern. And it seems to be pretty fractal. You can look at a, at a rich species clade within here, you can look at a family, you can look across persiform uh, fishes and, and you get a, a quite a fractal look at this. Um, so just a quick dive into linkage mechanics um, for those who care, won't last long for those who don't. So I'm getting into much more kind of quantitative simulation modeling of these linkage systems because they're everywhere. They're, you know, they're in your knee, they're in bird wings, they're in um, um, shrimp claws, and they're in, they're in fish heads all over the place. So we're, we're modeling these looking not only at the ratio of angles between links, but the vectors and pathways of the joints, which turn out to be what engineers like to look at. So what this does is it simulates 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 linkages, either randomly or via Brownian motion evolution, and, and then tests how these linkage vectors versus kinematic transmission ratios change with design of the linkage. So here's a, here's a sim where I've just, I just like to draw them all to see them. Um, this is 100 generations. Here's a Here's a thousand generations um, in this little app. Um, so I'm covering the whole linkage space within a set of simulation parameters over here, either the random or the Brownian motion sim. You can control it and, and specify how close it has to hue to a particular shaped linkage. What we can do then is look for convergence. Um, and if we define convergence by kinematic transmission being about one, one to 1.1, you get a bunch of linkages that satisfy that constraint, 15 of them out of a run of 100. 15% um, of them are satisfying this KT of about one. But look at them, their blue lines are their pathway of motion, all 15 of them, but the exception of maybe these two over here are doing something really different. Um, so there's this idea that, that the relationship between structure and function is loose because we get many different shapes producing the same KT. But what our simulations show is that this is not true, that all 15 of these are producing a unique motion 
that there is a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence between the geometry of a four-bar linkage and the details of its motion. You get the same KT. So if we, re if we restrict it to a particular pathway, which is what the jaws are, are designed for, we get a single linkage. If we restrict this vector to magnitude to a particular um, vector direction and angle, you get a single linkage. And, and so with path analysis, these linkages map perfectly one-to-one -one, um, structure to function. So it's, you know, it's something that I think that's, that's important as we start doing broad comparative analyses is that we move past this idea that, that many different shapes of linkages are doing the same thing because they're, they're actually really not. Okay, a little bit, little vignette on locomotion. Um, so I'm interested in pectoral fin shapes and that evolution of that on the tree. Um, we do a lot of clearing and staining. We're doing a lot of CT scanning and things like that now, but pectoral fins are just awesome in, in these wrasses and in a lot of other groups as well. And they, uh, you know, they move and they're shaped in different ways. On the left here is a rower. This is a, a harlequin tuskfish, high-speed video, showing him swinging his fin forward and rowing it backwards. On the right is a um, thalassoma wrasse, which has a very vertical um, flapping motion. These guys are using underwater flight. Um, they're like little bumblebees or hummingbirds zipping around the reef um, with a very vertical figure eight kind of generated motion. And here is a slow-mo, much more recent video, so you can really see the details of this in the flow tank. This is a parrotfish, which has a pretty high aspect ratio wing-like fin. You can see the bending in the fin rays, the torque of the fin like a propeller, and the three-dimensionally changing shape of the surface that we think um, if we could mimic it, we could produce propulsors, um, you know, uh, underwater vehicle propulsors that would be very efficient and extremely quiet. Um, a flapping pectoral fin is both more efficient and like a million times quieter than a propeller. And so we're trying to reconstruct this in great detail. Um, these two guys, Brett and Aaron, um, did a lot of three-dimensional analysis of this, and we can reconstruct the fin surface. This is this 3D thing. We're kind of looking at it from the side of the fish, the way we just were in the video. Now it's going to rotate around like that fish is swimming directly toward us. And so we can, we can analyze the changing camber and three-dimensional surface. Um, and the bending at each fin ray using this, this uh, 3D technique, which involves three high-speed video cameras, mirrors, and, and direct linear transformation. <laughs> it's a computational nightmare, but, but we're, we're getting it pretty streamlined. Um, so far, we haven't been able to use auto things like deep lab cut, so it's all manually digitized. But we look at fin shapes quite broadly because they associate with fin stiffness. Here's a range of fin shapes going from a, from a, a broad uh, fin to a very wing-like fin. This is some work with uh, Peter Wainwright back in the day. And when we map fin shape, here's a 340 species ras tree. We map, map fin shape and, and look at aspect ratio. Um, this was a paper that actually we published in, in PNAS in 2017. We find 24 origins of these high aspect ratio fins, these red bars. So these are the paired fishes again. They all have pretty high aspect ratio fins. There's a few reversions to kind of medium. But we see a similar pattern where we have bursts of diversification in fin shape. Different strategies are sprinkled throughout most of these clades. So we think there's you know, so going to be some interesting genomic correlations for both the jaw mechanics and the fin mechanics. Um, we're going to be targeting specific um, uh, jaw genes and, and fin genes and uh, genes that are associated with diet, um, kind of co-opting some of these really interesting results that have come from the cichlid folks who have shown that, that there are interesting bursts of cichlid diversification associated with particular parts of the genome. 
couple more examples. This is some of uh, um, Isaac's work on body shape and fin shape. So he looked at the tusk fishes and hog fishes. Um, here's Isaac down here. Oh no, wait, that's a tusk fish. There he is. Uh, <laughs> so he did morphometrics on a big sample of this. We have almost all the species. And this is his cool body shape phylomorphospace plot showing how all the, the thick headed and big body tusk fishes are off here to the right and these slender um, siphononathus and, and odacine uh, wrasses and some of the smaller bodied tusk fishes are, are up here at the top. So we're gonna be looking at, at partitioning which fins evolve the fastest in the group and particularly how does the pectoral fin shape evolve. Last example is sand diving in the wrasses. So these guys burrow in the sand and sleep under there all night. A whole bunch of species do it. And, and a lot are, are observed to do it. This is in my lab, a sort of fuzzy old um, high-speed video from some time ago. Um, one of my undergrads uh, worked this up and, and showed what the kinematics were to, to actually burrow under the sand and, and stay there. And we've... Um, done a lot of anatomy with this. These are all field museum specimens that we've prepared to look at correlates of burrowing. So these are all burrowers on the left and non-burrowers on the right. And the burrowers tend to have sort of similar body shapes and similar head shapes for penetrating with sediment and working your way under it, whereas non-burrowers have a, a lot of diversity. So we think that burrowing may constrain head shape and body shape. And we're working with uh, Corey Evans now on a CT scan sample of burrowers and non-burrowers. But the phylogeny of burrowers and non-burrowers is really interesting. This is uh, Teresa Tatumaker, uh, Tatumaker's work where um, we showed that the base of the tree, so the tree goes um, counterclockwise on this one. The, the sister group to the rest of the wrasses is here. These are the tusk fishers and hog fishers all the way up through the key lines and paired fishes and things like that, none of them burrow. We know that they're non-burrowing or we strongly suspect that they're non-burrowing, their body shapes are just not right. But then here in the crown of the tree, we see burrowing explode. So known burrowers are in red and there are certain clades of them. These are the razor fishes who all do it. Um, the green ones are likely to be burrowing. We suspect them of it, or there's anecdotal aquarium or scuba diver notes that they burrowed. Um, and, and the yellow ones are, are unlikely uh, to be burrowers um, for various reasons. So anyway, it's a rich system for looking at body shape and, and this interesting behavior of burrowing in wrasses. So I will end there and, and draw just a couple con conclusions. Um, we have a lot. Uh, a long way to go for coral reef fish phylogeny to have the whole picture. The big backbone tree is being developed by a number of groups. Um, um, lots of, of activity there from the from Tom Neer's lab and Peter Wainwright's lab and, and the Ort lab and the Bettencourt lab. Um, really great insights into higher level fish phylogeny. And in my group and a number of other groups, we're really after the species rich parts of that. So we need to get to, we need to all get together and graft together a, a giant tree that's based on phylogenomics at the broader level and, and maybe I'll bring in some of these smaller data sets more locally. Get lots of insight from this biogeography, um, evolutionary biomechanics, interesting uh, associations of traits with bursts of diversification and things like that. So like to thank all the people that did all this work <laughs> and thank you for your attention. I will stop share so I can see you all. And I'm actually happy to hang out questions as long as people want to hang out, particularly students. Um, Not a question, but Mark, I'm here. I wouldn't have missed this for the world. I was very excited when I saw it on the schedule. <laughs> hey, Lydia. <Okay. laughs> but I'll, uh, I'll save my questions for later when we catch up. OK. I have a couple of questions for you, Mark. Yeah. Um, one of them just shows my naivete. Like if you were to go to a Philippine reef or, a, or an Indonesian reef, 
and you see a bunch of fish there, what fraction of those would have turned up in, in your phylogeny? So are there like other major groups of reef fishes that you haven't really been focusing on or are you guys hitting all of them? Because that was a lot of phylogenies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, we, have, we have one for the goat fishes also, but we're missing, we're missing the gobies and blennies. Right. Other people are working on those and I defer to them. The people who are working on gobies, you know, they're they're crazy. There's thousands of them. <laughs> you know, they're like the beetles among insect people are the goby. And and, uh, you know, Luke Tornabini and, and others are really making good progress on, on gobies and and plenty phylogenetics is coming along. Um, we have some. We have some higher level data sets that, that have things like, you know, apogonids, the cardinal fishes, which are sister to the gobies apparently. And, but we're not focusing on those because other people are. And um, there's lots of interesting small groups. The pseudochromids are reef associated. And, and uh, I know Ron Atam was working on those for a while. Uh, not sure where that is, but they're a cool group to, to, for these species rich approaches. All the families are in these big eupercarian attempts at, at the at the overall tree for fishes. Um, so we're we're pretty close. I mean, we we basically are a few years, maybe a decade away from a, a really well resolved tree of all fishes. Um, and it's impossible to get every single one in there, but but uh, we're close. Yeah. Can I ask my my sort of more conceptual question? Yeah. Um, so I was thinking about that, uh, the simulator, uh, the, the four bar simulator, you were showing that you were doing yeah. these simulations. And is it possible with that system to run enough simulations that you could, where you were trying to maximize like jaw speed or maximize force and figure out if there's like an optimal phenotype that, and then whether or not the fish are actually matching those phenotypes. Do you have that kind of power with that simulation system, kind of an approximate Bayesian computation <laughs> for biomechanics? Yep, we're almost there. So what I've done so far is I, I give the, I limit the sim to four bar linkage shapes and starting position. The starting position is actually really important. What, what's the resting position for a linkage like that in a fish? It tends to be with the jaw joint all the way back and then it explodes that way. Um, if we, if we give it some bounds that's within standard fishdom and we let it run randomly or with the Brownian motion mechanism, we get all of the morphospace filled. And then we can throw on onto that filled morphospace from the sims where the real ones are in the wrasses or in other taxa. So we can find out where the gaps are in life and start to ask the question of why are, there, why are those gaps there? Um, we haven't done what you suggested, which is a great idea, and that is to give the sim a, a selection pressure to drive it towards high kinematic transmission or high displacement of the premaxilla or something, which we know fishes have exploited that axis of diversification. The, the displacement advantage of the uh, jaw protrusion is one of the things that varies a lot in cichlids and wrasses and you know, a lot of these taxa. Even even killifish, I think, probably <laughs> even pupfish. Um, so yeah, uh, we're not quite there yet with the selection pressure idea. But yeah, with with the uh, work on you know adaptive landscape kinds of things, would be neat to do. Cool and great talk. I'll, Thanks, I'll Chris. Go first. Did did you want to read your question, Juan, or I can read it for you? She she beat me to it in the chat. I don't know. Oh yeah, I'll look at the chat. Um, I had a question too after that. But. You mentioned that in the damselfish phylogeny, all the transition between pelagic and benthic taxa went through intermediate. What are the possible constraints that prevent the direct transition between pelagic and benthic types? Um, gosh, good question. I think, I think. It, it might be that in the phylogeny, we see that because at least in the base of the tree, the, the, the two successive sister groups toward the root, that, that one of them has gotten stuck in the benthic 
and doesn't transition much at all. And the other has gotten stuck in the pelagic and doesn't transition much at all. But I, I think, um, you know, a, there are pelagic clades that are mostly pelagic, but they transition to, to intermediate and then they transition to benthic. And I just think that the ecological switch between coming out of your hidey hole and feeding on plankton up in the water column, part of the wall of mouths that defends a coral reef from these waves of plankton coming over it. Um, the switch from doing that to just feeding on an algal garden or something is, is just uh, too big of, a, of an ecomorphological switch to make in one step. And so we only see it happen. There might be one example where we're probably missing species or something in there where, where we see the direct transition. Mm -hmm. so. uh, just quick follow-up question on this. So there are so few intermediate taxa comparing to the pelagic or benthic taxa. Um, could we say the intermediate ecological niche is not favored by the damsel fish? And if so, what would be the reason they do not favor that area? Yeah, there are there are clades of Pomacentris and a few Abudufduf that do the intermediate game. And I've been interested to look at the kinds of habitats that those intermediates are being successful at. Are they somehow depauperate habitats where they have to exploit both the plankton and the benthos in order to make a living? Um, or are they um, finding an intermediate, you know, niche that that allows them to coexist with the pure planktivore, the pure benthic carnivore. There are fewer of them, you know, there's 420 species and, you know, I think it's about 150 each of planktivore and benthic and then the rest are intermediates. Um, so certainly it's true that clades can be successful at the intermediate strategy, um, but they do get stuck it's one of the interesting things about it. Some clades get stuck on the pelagic or the benthic. And, you know, that's probably just because it works. And so that trait gets phylogenetically continued in, in these clades. But yeah, we don't, we don't know the ecological answers to these things, I don't think. Thank you, Mark. And thank you, Chris, for letting me ask first. <laughs> Now you beat me to it. It was a great. <laughs> and to follow up, I, Mark, you probably know Samantha Price's work, but she showed the same thing for, for all mammals that they have to transition between omnivory to go from carnivores to herbivory. Um, oh, is that right? Yeah, I'll try to, I'll send you that paper too. And yeah. if, if this question, my, my colleague Roy and I actually have a like predicting performance landscapes for suction induced flow fields. We're start, starting to publish on that a little bit now but trying to do the same kind of thing. I mean, your models are really cool and apparently written in Pascal. <laughs> they used to be. <laughs> and I wanted to ask. They're I all mean, Objective C now. But yeah. <laughs> I, I was quite surprised to hear the claim that, that, it, that the four bar linkage is really one-to-one -one mapping. And I think in particular, I mean, especially because these models, I mean, there's so many, like there's the opercular four bar too. And I think as we increase dimensionality of the phenotype, like these are already simplified models and we're seeing potentially many to one. And then as we expand these models to more accurately capture the complexities, I, I would predict we should see more many to one mapping. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on, you know, the, this, this um, prediction that, that it's really one to one mapping out there. Well, so, it's, it's easy to get back to many to one, okay? But it's not, the, the, the argument of this paper I'm writing is that it's not because of the linkage, okay? You can't, you can't use kinematic transmission to assess whether it's many to one, that's my point. And the reason is, is that kinematic transmission ratios are the ratio of one bone rotation to another in the system, two of the four elements are rotating. And because it's a ratio, by definition, there are an infinity of values that you could have to generate the same ratio, right? Just take a ratio of one. You could rotate one degree, two degree, three degree, four degree, and, and have it be symmetrical, and you'd get a KT of one, but those bones are rotating in completely different, you know, amounts and with different displacements and different sizes, all kinds of things can be going on. So KT is the 
is not the right measure for measuring mapping of structure to function. And when you add a muscle to the system, it gets even wiggier, right? So a muscle can do a hundred different things. Same muscle, different contraction pattern or something. And so it's really one to many. You can get many outputs from one single individual can move its jaw fast or slow, depending on what it does with its muscles. So we need to take that into account. But I think you're right that what we're gonna come down to is that you know, muscles are contracting, bones are rotating, jaws are flying forward, suction's being produced, and we are, we're gonna get a lot of different configurations of all that stuff that are generating the same amount of suction and are achieving prey capture in exactly the same way. We're gonna get back to many to one mapping being true. You know, it's called convergence. I, I prefer just calling it convergence, but, but it's not because the linkage is not perfectly aligned to its anatomy. So it's, it's just one of these nitty gritty details that I care a lot about. And so I just wanna show how linkage structure itself is one-to-one, -one, but with muscles and all these other peripheral system, we, we're, we're gonna be able to get back to many-to-one. It'll be interesting. Makes sense. And I forgot to add, we're gonna to have to make Lydia the, the honorary staff curator of ichthyology. I, I had no idea. <laughs> Lydia <laughs> secretly a fish person. <laughs> Thanks again, <Yes>. Mark. <laughs> Can I ask a question? I, no. I decline that position as it will no doubt come with more work. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that wonderful it's, talk, Mark. It's um, an honor to be nominated. I had a, a general question. I was wondering about what your thoughts are after looking at this broad, diverse um, you know, set of fishes about how independent you think the dentition and the jaw patterning are. And so given the morphology of the upper and lower jaw, do you think you can predict aspects of tooth number, size, and shape, or do you think those are evolving largely independently? Boy, you know, Carly Cohen is a grad student at, at UW working with um, Adam Summers, and she's looking at RAS teeth now um, from the point of view of homodonty versus heterodonty, right? And so you can imagine uh, so, some wrasses have very similar teeth all the way to the front. And then there's a canine or something for gripping. And so there's a little bit of heterodonty in size and shape and stuff like that. But a lot of fish teeth are fairly homodont. Um, but imagine what Carly's, um, I've done some com computational modeling with her. Well, Carly's point is that if all the teeth were exactly the same size and shape, they would be heterodont because the jaw forces are lower at the front and higher at the back. So each tooth would be cutting or puncturing in a different way because the force regime they experience every bite is different if they were exactly the same shape on the lever output um, distance. So we think that some of the tooth shapes and, and sharpnesses are tuned along the jaw to accommodate the differing forces that they experience during a typical bite um, or, you know, grass or whatever the fish is doing. So, um, you know, looking at some of those jaws I showed, they're just outrageously different um, between species and even within taxa, um, there's a lot of variability there. Um, you know, the the jaw length and some of the dentition is determined by some of these um, regulatory genes, BMP4, signaling pathways and things like that, that, that I think uh, would be interesting to survey more broadly to see if we can find any kind of bursts of genetic variability that are associated with den either the teeth themselves or the, the whole jaw variation. Thanks. Long way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So Chris, how's the fish collection come along? We're, we've got, I think, almost 20,000 specimens now cataloged. So we're, we're, I have a really good um, work study student, actually, who's been on it. 
I think she's awesome. cataloging right now, actually. <laughs> Pretty much nonstop since we moved. So we almost have everything cataloged that I moved with. Is it a mixture of local and sort of global stuff or mostly regional? Yeah, I mean, as you can guess, it's mostly Caribbean pupfishes and, and West yeah. Africa Cameroon cichlids, right? But I also have uh, Bruce Turner. I don't know if you never met him. Yeah. Just, he actually sent me his entire collection of pupfish for his whole entire career when I was oh, a grad. Oh, wow, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So I've been carrying his around. Um, we've, we've got a lot of things from Death Valley too. So, And, and some random deep sea things and some, you know, we're, we're working on it. That's great. No, it's so, so great to have you there and see that collection growing. And thanks for bringing more fishes to the MVZ today. It's always great to hear more brass stories. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, what was my, I actually had another question for you since nobody else is, is speaking up, but you introduced your talk with the lionfish and uh, it's such a cool system. I mean, probably the most rapid marine invasion of all time, right? And yeah. uh, there was some paper that I cannot remember. Maybe it was, maybe it was with you, but the authors claim the lionfish also has a novel prey capture strategy where it blows water towards its prey. And then the prey fish just naturally kind of swims upstream. So they feel the, <laughs> are you familiar with this? Have you seen anything like I that? I haven't seen that. that. No, I haven't looked at that. <laughs> that was my that recent? I don't think it's that recent. I think it was several years okay. ago and I was always skeptical. And I, I, I bet if they were doing this, and it was claimed this was a new behavior that none of the, the sort of Caribbean reef fish had seen before, and that they blow the water first, and the, the fish heads upstream, and then the lionfish is right there, so that it has a sort of better orientation for prey capture. And they, and they use their pectoral fins to kind of herd them, too. They're <laughs> like a bat, huh? <laughs> yeah, they're, they're a multifaceted predator. Now, our, our data our high speed films show that they're using a little bit of ram we don't we don't see any evidence of blowing ahead of time i mean i believe it that it does happen um if if that was an observation they made in the field or was that in the lab yeah the problem when you can't remember the paper or the authors <laughs> to track that down. i'll look it up yeah <laughs> i mean i i trust your judgment more like i think it's probably maybe it was a story I, that I was always a little bit skeptical of, but would be, I mean, that would be really cool too. And, and Carol, thank you. Can, Kelly Rice, my, she is cataloging right now. <laughs> <laughs> so. Dedication. Yep. Yep. <laughs> That's great. Well, yeah. we'll catch up with you in person soon. Yes. It'd be great. See you at a meeting or something. Um, so I don't know if is there a meeting with students or is there we're kind of wrapping it up here. It's fine. Um, I got the chance to talk to the students before, so yeah, I think um, they just knew that you would be on for a little bit longer. So if there aren't any more questions, I'll end the recording. But thank you so much. Okay, thank you, everybody. <laughs>